Next, we will turn to working with numbers. Java happens to have four integer types, int, short, long, and byte. And they only differ in their ranges. Int is what you use most frequently. It's a four byte integer that ranges from about minus two billion to two billion. If int is not long enough, for example, if you need to represent the number of people on this planet accurately, then you would use long, which has a humongous range that should be good enough for most purposes. Once in a while, one might use short, for example, if you need to directly work with file formats that use it, or byte, again, when you work directly with files. Most of the time, you're going to be using int, and once in a while, long. And you can safely ignore the other ones for right now. When you write down a number, it's called a number literal. And there's special notations for different kinds of literals. When a number ends in L, then it's a long number. When it starts with 0x, it's hexadecimal. And when it starts with 0b, it's a binary number. When you have long numbers, you're also allowed to put in underscores to separate whatever groupings it is that you want to separate. Here we're writing down a binary number as a sequence of four-bit groups. Whatever underscores you put into number literals are simply ignored. There are two floating point types in Java called float and double. You will almost always use double. The only reason to use float is because you're working with some library that requires it. There are special values that indicate plus or minus infinity and not a number value that you get when you make a floating point computation that doesn't have a valid result. And these are written as double dot followed by the names of those special values. The next type that we're going to examine is called car or char. Originally, this type was used to denote Unicode characters. At that time, Unicode was a 16-bit code, and a car value is a 16-bit value. Then, unfortunately, something terrible happened that after Java was born, Unicode expanded from 16-bit to 20-bit. And so what nowadays is a Unicode character is no longer necessarily the same as a car value. Some Unicode characters require one car value, and others require two. So for example, the letter A has Unicode code point hex 41, and it's then encoded as a single car value of hex 41, or decimal 65. But this funny looking thing here, this O with the two vertical bars, which by the way is used to denote the mathematical set of octonians, was added to Unicode quite late. And so it has a rather large code point that cannot be represented with 16 bits. And then it's represented with a sequence of two car values in an encoding called UTF-16, which we don't really need to know about. But the fact it remains that this particular character has two car values. So that means that car is not all that nice. It's only really useful for you when you know exactly how the encoding works, or if you're in a situation where you know that you will never run into Unicode characters that are greater or equal than code point 1000. Well, when do you know that? That's really not so easy to say. Nowadays, lots and lots of characters do require two car values. Many Chinese characters do, emoticons do. And so you should probably be prepared to write code that correctly works with whatever strings you get. Character literals are enclosed in single quotes. For example, single quote A, single quote means the character A, which is exactly the same thing as the decimal value 65. There are a few character literals that start with a backslash. The one that you're most likely going to see is backslash N, the new line character that when you print it just gives you a new line in the console. You can denote arbitrary Unicode values by starting with backslash U followed by four hexadecimal digits. As it happens, the particular character that you see here is the trademark symbol. The last basic type that we're going to look at is the Boolean type with two values, false and true. And that's pretty much all that one needs to know about the Boolean type. If you're a C or C++ programmer, you may know that in those languages, one can convert the integer 0, 1 to the Boolean values, false and true, and the other way around that conversion is not valid in Java, and it really never made any sense in C and C++ either. Altogether, Java has eight primitive types that you see here, int long short byte for integers, double float for floating point numbers, car for characters, and the Boolean type. And these primitive types are a little bit special, as you'll see later, 
because everything else in Java is an object. The next thing that you need to know whenever you work with a new programming language is how do you declare variables. In Java, unlike, for example, Python or JavaScript, every variable that you declare must have a type. Java is what's called a strongly typed programming language. In Java, the type comes before the name of the variable. For example, here you see first the type and then the name. It's optional to initialize a variable. Here we're initializing this variable with the value 12. But of course, it's always a good idea. In Java, you can declare variables any way you want, and it's considered good form to declare them as close as possible to their first use. Unlike, for example, in C, where one declares all the variables first and then puts all of the statement in the code. Once a variable has been declared, you can reassign a value. Here, for example, we're changing the value of vacation days to 11. If you don't want that, if you want a variable to always have the same value, you declare it as final. So that's the same as const in other languages. Final makes a variable into a constant. The word final means that once the variable has been initialized, then that's the final time that you had a chance to change it. Now that you know what number types there are in Java, let's see what we can do with them. Of course, there are the usual arithmetic operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And like in C or C++, integer division and integer remainder or modulus are also denoted by a slash for division and a percent sign for remainder. But both of the operands have to be integers. Let me demo how these work, and I'll be using a different tool for that than the integrated development environment that you've seen so far. Starting with Java 9, there is a convenient tool called JShell where you can type in Java code and it gets executed directly without the need of having to write a public static void main, without the need to have to compile anything. This interactive shell is really useful to explore small aspects of Java, which is exactly what I want to do right now. So for example, when I type in 15 divided by 2, then JShell tells me the expression value is 7, so the result is 7, and it's an int. Whereas when I type 15.0 divided by 2, then the answer is the more familiar looking 7.5, and that's a double. So as you can see, when both operands of the slash are ints, then Java carries out an integer division, and it throws away the remainder. What if we want the remainder? That's where the percent comes in, and the remainder of the division of 15 by 2 is 1. Here it is. To compute roots and powers, you don't use operators in Java, you use functions. Those functions are in the math class, so you have to first put in the name of that class, math, and a period, and then the name of the method, that's sqrt for square root. To compute powers, you similarly use the pow function. Let's just try it out. The square root of 4 is 2, and let's compute 10 raised to the third power, and that's 1,000. Another useful function is floor mod, which is almost the same thing as the remainder, but with better behavior for negative values. For example, if you compute minus 15 mod 2, then the answer is minus 1. And that can sometimes be inconvenient. But if you compute floor mod of minus 15 and 2, then you get the answer plus 1. So if you're ever in a situation where negative remainders bother you, just think floor mod. For trigonometry, logarithms, and so on, there's a wealth of functions, sine, log, and many more that you can find in API documentation. When you work with numbers, and there's so many number types, you have to be a bit careful what happens when one type gets converted to another. Let's say I have an integer, and now I declare a double variable, and I put my integer in there, then you would expect that that just works, and indeed it does. I had an integer 4, and now my double variable contains 4.0. What if I do it the other way around? That does not work in Java. Java says these types are incompatible because in general when you have a floating point value, it has a fractional part, and it would have to be thrown away when you move it to an integer. And Java does not do that automatically. In this chart, you see which conversions are automatic in Java. You can go from an int to a double, but there's no arrow from double to int, so the other conversion is not valid.
Generally, the conversions are valid if they don't lose information. From an int to a long, for example, is fine. There are a few conversions that might lose some information. From a long for a double, for example, because a long can have extra digits that would not show up in a double. The double would be an approximation of the long. That's still considered OK. But when there's real information loss, or the potential for such real information loss, then Java would disallow the conversion. What if you want to do it anyway? There is a special syntax for that called the cast syntax. So let's say I have a floating point value, say 9.997. And now I want to turn that into an integer. I type the word int in parentheses before the value that I want to have converted to an integer. And here's the conversion result. It is 9. As you can see, the cast from a floating point number to an integer throws away the entire fractional part. That 0.997 is gone. Maybe that's what you want. But in many situations, you would prefer to do rounding instead. There's a function for that, math.round. So let's just try that. And that gives me 10. Now, when you look carefully here, you'll notice that round gives you a value of type long. Because after all, a floating point number could be quite large, larger than what you can store in an int. If, on the other hand, you know that the result fits in an int, then you can take the result of round, which is a long, and cast it to an int like I'm doing here, and then you can assign it to an int variable. There are other operators than just the mathematical operators in Java. First off, when you have any operator at all, you can combine it with an assignment. So here, look at n plus equals 4. That's the same thing as saying n equals n plus 4. In other words, compute n plus 4 and stuff it back into n. And that works with any operator at all. So you can use minus equal, asterisk equal, and so on. Like in C and C++, you have the increment and decrement operators. n plus plus takes n and adds 1 to it. n minus minus subtracts 1 from n. When you want to compare two values, you use a relational operator, such as less than or less than equal, greater, greater equal. For equality, you use equal equal with two equals in a row. And for inequality, you use this thing that's supposed to look somewhat like a not equal sign in mathematics. When you have conditions with a Boolean value, you often want to combine them so that the answer is true if both conditions are true or one of the conditions is true. And for that, we have the Boolean operators and written as two ampersands or written as two vertical bars and not written as the exclamation mark. And the easiest way to remember that is that's the same thing as in the not equal. Then there are a number of bitwise operators that operate on individual bits of an integer value. I'm just showing you what they are, but I'm not going to discuss those further in this lesson. And there is a potentially convenient conditional operator that is an operator that works similar to an if-else. So it reads here, if x is less than y, then the answer is x. Otherwise, the answer is y. In general, the conditional operator takes a condition, something that evaluates to a Boolean, true or false. And depending on whether it's true or false, the second or the third element is the result. So now you've seen all of the operators that Java has to offer. And we'll move on to more advanced types. In Java, you can define an enumerated type. That's a type that has a restricted set of values. And it's easiest to explain with an example. Here I'm defining an enumerated type called size. So size is a type, like int or Boolean. And there are four possible sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. I'm listing all of the possibilities in the enumeration. Then you can declare a variable of this type. Size is the type. It comes first. Then you have the name of the variable. That would be s. And then you initialize it with one of the values. To name the value, you have to again list the type first, then a period, and then the name size.medium. Because after all, there might have been some other enumeration that also has a medium. What's the use? Now you know that s can only contain one of these four values. And you'll never have to worry in your code whether s was set to something like minus 1 or some other value. It's only going to be one of these four. Well, that's almost correct. It can be a fifth value, namely the value null. That means that none of these applies. For any enumeration, or for that matter, for any object variable, as we'll see soon, there's always the possibility that it's set to null. Hello again with another Java 9 News Flash. In these lectures, you've seen me using JShell 
And I told you that at the time it was an experimental feature. Now J shell is a part of Java 9, 10, and so on. You all have it, and you really want to use it. So if you haven't already done it, follow along as I demo this. Open a terminal, type J shell, and then type in commands. For example, to answer the age-old question, what is the square root of 1764? You just paste it in, and it's 42. Of course, the answer to everything. Now we can use this result, which is stored in a variable called dollar one. Do dollar one plus one, and that's 43, stored now in a variable called dollar two. So these variables increment, and you can use them in your calculations. A few things that you want to know to work effectively with JShell, you can use the arrow keys to edit prior commands. Let me demo that. So here the arrow keys just walk you through what you've already done. When you use the tab key, you get reasonable suggestions. Here I'm hitting the tab key after having typed hello and a period, and I now get everything that I can invoke on the string hello, the methods of Java Lang object and of Java Lang string. So if I type to you and then hit the tab key, now it gets constrained to two uppercase, and I get an opening parenthesis. Why not also a closing parenthesis? Well, let me hit tab again, and now you can see why, because there are actually two methods, two uppercase. One takes a locale object, and one takes nothing. So now I complete it with nothing, and I get an uppercase hello. Now I could have also hit the tab key again. Then you see the online documentation somewhat unattractively formatted for the terminal. I don't usually use that feature. A couple of really useful tips for using JShell. Sometimes you don't want to store things in these $1, $2 variables because it's hard to remember what's what. In that case, hit Shift tab followed by the letter V, and then a type appears, and the cursor is moved right into the right spot to declare a variable. That way you don't have to type the type by hand. That's nice. The second useful feature is if you need an import declaration and you don't want to type it, JShell will do it for you. Here, for example, I type instant, and then I hit shift tab followed by an I, and now I get an option to import this class, and now instant knows its methods. So these two shortcuts, shift tab V and shift tab I, are your friends. And just in another newsflash about Java 10, this will greatly change the appearance of many Java programs. In Java 10, you no longer have to declare the types of local variables. You can just use the keyword var. Here, for example, I have a counter. It's initialized with zero, and I declare it as a var, and Java knows that zero is an int, so it'll declare counter as an int. Here, I have a different variable that it initialized with a string, and the var here then means string. It's still strongly typed. I cannot put a 0 0.5 into this counter variable. 0 0.5 is a double. Counter was declared as an int. The declaration comes from the type of the initialization, and it's then illegal to put something from a different type. It's not like in JavaScript. This is particularly useful for unwieldy type names. As a horrifying example, the get all stack traces method of the thread class returns an object of some undecipherable type, and now I no longer have to use it in the declaration. I just say var, and it's automatically used. So I predict this is going to be a really popular feature. We're not using this feature in these lessons yet, but over time, we'll all get used to it.